Good morning, Gordon. How are you doing today? I'm hanging in. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, we don't need to give the numbers. We could just look at the price reaction here. You've been following this stock for a long time. Give us a Give us your short-term and your long-term take here on this earnings report. Yeah, so I think the earnings report was in line with what we expected. I think it was weaker than what the street expected. There's three key things I'll highlight. There's a number of things we can talk about. But number one, right, Tesla had on every previous earnings uh, uh, um, basically release talked about a 50% um, CAGR. They said they were going to grow 50% annually. They completely took that out of the most recent earnings slide. That's number one. Number two, um, they gave guidance of notably lower growth. So their growth in units uh, last year was 37%. The street has them growing like you know 22% this year. They're saying no, notably lower than 37%. So I think that's going to be below uh, the 20% the street has them growing this year. And then they said, a number of times they said their gross margins effectively are going to go lower from Q4. So they said the benefits of gross margins are going to be worse going forward. So it looks like their margins have peaked, whereas a lot of people are saying the margins have dropped. A couple of other things. They said their tax rate is now going to be 25 percent, whereas in the third quarter it was 8.17 percent. And in the fourth quarter, we can get into this, they had a $5.7 billion dollar tax benefit. We could talk about that, but it, it reeks the high heavens in our view. Um, uh, and then lastly, you know, they talked about this uh, next gen model, but they said it's not coming until the end of 2025. So you're talking about two years with no new models, stale models, low volume production. And they said they're going to produce that $25,000 car in Texas, right? They were supposed to produce that in Mexico. We know they delayed their Mexican facility indefinitely. Then they said they were going to do China. There were a number of other countries that were rumored. Why is it important they're doing it in Texas? Here's why it's important. Texas is a high cost production market. You're talking about paying your factory workers in Texas roughly $50 an hour versus $10 an hour in Mexico, $5 an hour in China. There's no way in our view that car is going to be competitive if they make it in Texas. So them saying that suggests to us they're not ramping any more new facilities. So I think overall, this is quite bad near term because you're talking about street numbers that are too high. And I think it's very bad long term because this is a stock valued at 100 times our 2024 EPS estimate that we think earnings growth is going to be negative. That's absurd. So I think that's the setup. Gordon, what about the consumer? Let's just look and just take a look at, you know, the overall consumer, because I've argued for a while, maybe this isn't even just going to be a Tesla problem. I mean, We've had higher interest rates. Does this not impact the, the the consumer's ability to buy new cars? Like, I mean, Ford, GM, you know, and obviously you don't cover those stocks, but you know, they've backed off on EV production here. Is there a case that the U.S. consumer just may have less money in 2024 to buy new cars? Well, no, that's something Elon Musk is saying to try to kind of shield himself okay. from weak demand for Tesla's cars specifically. Uh, demand for ICE cars is still strong. Demand for cars that people want are still strong. Look, the reason why people are exiting the EV space is simple. It's because they're not profitable. Think about this. Tesla's net margin in Q4 was 7.9%. They just told you their, 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 their tax rate is going from 8% to 25%, and they've already done a price cut in Q1 of 2024 equivalent to 5%. So they're now a profit. They're again now a profitless EV manufacturer. That's why Ford, GM, VW, Toyota, um, uh, and a battery manufacturers, Panasonic, LG, CATL. That's why they're pulling back billions of dollars they plan to invest in EVs because it's just not profitable. So I think that the reason why Tesla has problems is because the consumer just doesn't like and doesn't want to buy EVs. That's the real issue here. And I know I'm the only guy who says that, so it's hard to grasp. But you can see the guys who know this market see the market much better than any of us, me included, that the, the auto manufacturers and the battery manufacturers are pulling back hundreds of billions of dollars in investment. So the, the, the proof is in the pudding, if you will. Gordon, one more for you. Uh, the, what I'm looking at on, on Twitter here this morning, and I've seen a lot of talk about it, even though, you know, the cars obviously not selling quite as much as we, we maybe what 
you know, the numbers weren't as good. I'm seeing a lot of people talk about these humanoids. I'm thinking, seeing a lot of people talk that, you know what, Tesla's not just a car company. It's a technology <laughs> company, and they have these humanoids coming that they're eventually going to sell and make a lot of money with. Some people saying it's going to be the most valuable company in the world because of the humanoids. Where yeah. are they in this production, like, and where and how far are they from, like, being able to actually sell these things? So two years ago, you would have told me the same thing, but you would have said Cybertruck. Four years ago, you would have told me the same thing, but you would have said FSD. Six years ago, you would have told me the same thing, but you would have said the Tesla Semi. Listen, this is our opinion, but this is a pump and dump scheme at this point. They have all these products. You know, where's the ventilators? Where's the Semi truck that actually we have specs on? Where's the $40,000 Cybertruck? Where's the $25,000 car? Where's the factory that makes the factory? I mean, Elon Musk comes up with a lot of these products that are years out, and then he doesn't execute on them. It's not like he promises and delivers late. He just doesn't deliver at all. You know, where, where's the, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 solar panels or whatever he said, you know, the fake solar panels he, he showed to, to sell Solar City. We never saw those. There's always this carrot that he puts out there. With respect to humanoids, you know, Boston, Boston, uh, what is it? Boston Analytics. Boston Dynamics. Dynamics, I'm sorry, has been at this for decades, right? And, 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 and you know, the, the video that Elon Musk just showed, we now know it was a complete fake. There was a guy controlling it to the right of the video. Where are they at with humanoids? I don't think it's ever coming, but it's a way for people like, <clears throat> excuse me, Morgan Stanley and, and, and Kathy Wood to put a valuation not justified by any reality. Think about this, right? Think about this. For years, Elon Musk has said Dojo, the Dojo computer teaches their cars to drive themselves. They have millions of miles of data, right? In fact, in September of last year, Morgan Stanley, Adam Jonas did a 60 page note where he took his price target, I think from 250 to 400 and gave Dojo a $500 million, billion dollar, I'm sorry, valuation, right? Dojo is not mentioned in any 10Q or K of Tesla. And last night, Elon Musk said it's quote, a long shot. Um, so he's been basically selling this to people for years. And last night, he effectively almost completely discounted it out of the Tesla story. Um, you got to look at these things, right? You got to look at these promises he's made. And the fact that my peers on Wall Street, highly respected firms, are giving this company hundreds of billions of dollars of valuation for this vaporware. It's crazy. We believe it's analytical malpractice. And um, I think that the, the results this year um, are going to prove that this company has big problems. Let's move on to another sector. You just mentioned uh, the Solar City takeover. I can remember that a long time ago. Uh, but in, let's uh, since we're on kind of like the bearish theme here, talk to us about the solar sector here. Is there any any recovery, short term or long term, uh, for the solar sector? Yeah. So look, I just want to remind you guys: you can make money shorting stocks too, right? You can short <laughs> stocks and make money. It seems like shorting is like uh, you know the plague these days. Last year, we had a big call short solar, and it worked out fantastic. It was a fantastic short. It was probably one of the best shorts in the stock market. The problem with solar is simple. Uh, we put out a note this morning highlighting this. Uh, China is reaching grid constraints. China is roughly 50% of global solar demand. Last year, China grew 40%. The expectation is China is not going to grow at all this year. Given the overcapacity in the solar space, if China doesn't grow, you're going to see a further collapse in prices, and that is not factored in. So I think the parts makers, the Jinko Solars, the Canadian Solars, the solar edges of the world, I think are going to see tremendously more downside, I think an incremental downside this year. So I think those shorts are going to work out quite well. And then moving to the Sun Runs and the Sonovas and the Sun Powers of the world, these aren't really solar companies. They're effectively um, uh, specialty finance companies. Um, I call them subprime solar roofers. The problem is if interest rates go up, which, which clearly they are, um, and they have been, these companies are facing basically extinction. Sun Power has already defaulted um, on uh, one of their warehouse facilities. They're close to being forced into bankruptcy. And I think Sunrun and Sonova aren't far behind. Uh, the, the problem is their loans don't generate cash. So I think there's two distinct plays in the solar space. You want to play the supply demand story on the parts makers to the downside, and you want to play 
the uh, interest rate story um, and the potential um, uh, bankruptcy story on the uh, on the on the resi rooftop side. All right, Gordon. So say you wanted to play the kind of clean tech trade uh, long. Are there any you know sectors within clean tech that you do like? We love uranium. We've, we've liked it for a while. I think we were one of the first. I think we, we, we initiated on Cameco around, I think, like 13 bucks. I think the stock's just under 60. It may be 60 now. It's a very simple story. You know, everybody wants to go net zero. You know, with intermittent, dis, intermittent peak load power like solar and wind, you can't do that. You need distributed base load. And the only way to do that is nuclear. And globally, governments are moving towards nuclear now. And when you add to that, you have these financial players like Sprott who have come in and brought up all the excess spot supply. You're talking about a powder keg under prices. Clearly, prices have went a lot higher. We're talking about $100 uh, U308 uh, per pound right now. But you could see another you know, stair step higher in those prices. And if that happens, that will be reflected in the stocks. We think there's tremendous upside in these stocks. We think there's going to be a move out of solar out of EVs, into uranium at some point. So you're going to get that you know, euphoria play, we believe, as well. We would be very aggressively buying, buying uh, Cameco at this point. Yeah, and we saw, I mean, when the uh, Russia-Ukraine war started and Europe was having all these energy problems, France was actually in a better position than a lot of other countries because it did have more uh, nuclear and it is building more. Do you think we can see that in the United States at some point in the next 10, 15 years? It seems like our leaders here in the United States are so against this type of clean energy. That's a great that's a great question and a great point. You look at Diablo Canyon out in uh, California. They were supposed to decommission that. They didn't. You're talking about uh, a lot of uh, talk and support around small uh, uh, module nuclear reactors in the U.S., the U.S. is clearly moving back towards nuclear, um, as are other countries. And you're talking about, you know, people are, for instance, people are expecting a lot of incremental supply from Nextera. But the question is, is that mine real? I think nobody's looked into that. We've started to. Um, so I think the U.S. has to move that way because if you want, again, if you want to move towards net zero, but you want reliable power that is cost effective and works, you got to do nuclear. Solar and wind just don't work. And you see that with respect to Hawaii having to move completely away from solar uh, because they did too much rooftop. It, it, it constrained their grid. And California effectively doing the same with the NEM 3.0 rules. So I think the U.S. has to move that way. It's, it's not a factor of if. It's a factor of when. And I think the win is now. And you're also having other countries move back to nuclear. So we like the space. And I think that once you know, it becomes more popularized. You have, you know, people like me talking about it, more people. I think you're going to have that euphoric trade in the uranium space as well. We've been on the line with Gordon Johnson. He runs GLJ Research, joining us here on Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Gordon, thanks for coming on, and we'll be dialing you up again real soon. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.